boxing's always been a metaphor for life. I remember when I came back from my crushing loss on national TV, my daughter, Rebecca, she looked at my broken nose and my black eye and she said, Daddy, do you feel bad? She was a little kid, like eight years old. I said, listen to me, this might be one of the most important things I have to teach you. I am so sad and disappointed, but I don't feel bad. You know why? I trained as hard as I could. I didn't stop getting up. The referee stopped the fight. I was getting up. I kept getting knocked down. I kept getting up. And I tried as hard as I could. So I don't feel bad. And I want you to get the difference between the two. Because if you never try to do anything, you're not living. You got to go for it. You got to go for it. But you have to define what it is. Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman. Let's get started. Today, I have a very good friend and mentor, Dr. Hacky Reitman with me from Different Brains. Welcome, Hacky. Oh, thank you. You're too kind as always. <laughs> right back at you. For those of you who don't know Hacky, there's not enough words to describe the man. He is the genius behind ADHD Power Tools, which was my first co-hosted podcast with Ali Idris, and it's on the Different Brains platform. He is a mentor to many. He is an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a children's activist, a neurodiversity advocate. He's also a retired orthopedic surgeon, a former professional heavyweight boxer, who's had a lot of knockouts. <laughs> and he currently is a CEO of Fort Lauderdale, Florida-based PCE Media. And his mission is to achieve excellence in creating family-friendly content that will affect positive social change. So it's in his spirit and with a desire to get society to understand and embrace neurodiversity, which is so important here. And he founded Different Brains because of that. He is also a contributor here, including writing blogs, posting the interview, showing exploring different brains, which he's featured me on a couple of times. And he's uh, produced co and co-directed the full-length independent film, The Square Root of Two, which is the story of a challenged student with various challenges and seizure disorder. He is also the co-author of Asper Tools, which is based on his uh, child who has autism. Um, he has won many awards. I can go on and on and on and on, but we won't have enough time to find out about Hacky's journey and interview him if we do. So welcome, Hacky. Thank you very much. I feel like I was just at my funeral. <laughs> that was a eulogy. That was great. <laughs> Hey, at your funeral, we will be partying and celebrating your life. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes, Party yes. On. Party and on. I apologize. I have a little bit of a throat cold today, so I'm a little hazy. All right. Well, I appreciate you making the effort to be on, even though you have your throat cold. So thank you for continuing with your mission. You have had much success. And... As I mentioned in your introduction, you were an orthopedic surgeon, a heavyweight boxer, parent. So you did talk about a little bit of your motivation to start different brains, but what really drove you to say, okay, I still haven't set forth on my mission yet, and I'm not done in this world. I need to do more. Well, I think the main thing is my mother, <laughs> Evelyn Goldberg Reitman, when she was pumping gas at the family gas station in Jersey City, one of my older brothers came to her and had an uh, 88 on a spelling test. And she said, oh, I'm going to make you cookies tonight. And a couple of days later, I... <laughs> came in with a 92 on a spelling test. And she started hitting me with a dog leash. And I said, what is that about? He gets an 88, he gets cookies, I get a 92, I get that. She said, you have a moral obligation to work up to your full potential with the gifts that God gave you. 
and to make a good living for your family and to help those less fortunate and to have a good time doing it. And it's that last part that gets lost. See, people like you, you like what you're doing. You're having a good time. You found your passion. And what I encourage our interns to do and anybody else who listen is seek out what you really want to do. And if you can find something you love doing, that you're good at doing or can become good at doing, that you can make a good living at and help others and have a good time doing it, that's a whole ball of wax. Yeah, you only get one shot at this, right? That's right. So you got to go for the ghost, though. I have so many, exactly, in your boxing terms. I um, I have so many clients and people around me saying, oh, if I could just, you know, do my hobby as a passion. And the other day I'm reading on Entrepreneur Magazine that a woman took her hobby and made it a living, make, making $30,000 a week. So you just never know, right? No, you don't. You got to give it a shot. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about different brains. I mean, you have interns that you mentor, you really run the full gamut of helping the neurodiverse community. Well, what we're trying to do is to uh, help make the world realize that um, it's an inclusive world. We have to make it inclusive and that everybody's brain is different. Just like we have different skin colors and some of us are tall and short. All our brains are different. And so we have to get rid of this notion that one size fits all. If I have uh, Brooke in a class and I have Joseph in a class, I'm not going to teach them the same way exactly because their brains are different. If I'm a doctor, every patient is different. Like as an orthopedic surgeon, I got to know the families. I got to know the patient. You could have a... uh, As an orthopedic surgeon, I was a sports medicine specialist. You could have a quarterback on one team and a quarterback on another team, and they come from different backgrounds, and you, for their knee injury, you have to treat them both differently because Mm. they're going to approach it differently. And that sounds like an overstatement, but I've not found it to be. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even think we would go there, but now that you mentioned, you know, leveling the playing field for students, leveling the playing field for clients and patients, what do you think about the role of AI in... AI, like so many things in our lives, is a double-edged sword. (laughs) It can be really, really great, and it can be really, really hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. I look at it mainly in the positive way, okay? I look at it as it's going to let people who are unable to speak, speak. People who are unable to read, digest books better. I mean, I'm looking at all the positive stuff. Is there a lot of negative stuff? Yeah, but I'm going to let people smarter than me figure out how to deal with that. I think overall, it's going to be a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe with the help of humans still there, because if you have a teacher who is a robot, or if you have a surgeon who is a robot, but you go in and there's something different going on, that sometimes takes intuition. Oh, right? well, yeah. Like so many things in our life, it's going to be, where do I draw the line? Right. It's just like you, when you pick out topics for your show, where am I going to draw the line? You know, exactly. When we eat food, where am I going to draw the line? I know what's healthy, you know, but as Mark Twain said, we all know what's good for us. Nobody wants to do it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So you started off by saying that you got a 92. Your mom felt you didn't reach your full potential on that test. And that was part of the driver to start different brains. You have created this beast to help people, not only in Fort Lauderdale, but worldwide. Can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly goes on in different brains? Sure. What goes on is we start with the intern, say, what do you want to do? 
let's expose you to different skill sets to see what you want to do. Try and write an article. I never wrote an article before. Well, try it. We'll help you. And most of the media produced is produced by our volunteers and our interns who are basically an all-volunteer organization. And so we've become the largest producer of multimedia neurodiversity advocacy because they start doing things. Yeah, let me edit. Let me try to make a movie. Let's do an interview like this. Let's do exploring different brains where I've gotten to interview like 350 of the world's experts like yourself in all different things because it's all a spectrum and every brain is different. ADHD, which thanks to efforts of pioneers like yourself, is finally being recognized as saying, yeah, I guess about uh, 10, 20 percent of people have that. Maybe we ought to pay attention to it. OK, in the same way, we're like, um, maybe we ought to have handicapped bathrooms. So if somebody's in a wheelchair, they can get in and out. I mean, the big light goes on and pioneers like Brooke Schnittman make the light go off. And what I'm trying to do is create pioneers. <laughs> I'm trying to self advocates are the biggest forms of hope for our world self advocates like yourself thank you now the, you obviously have a lot of drive and patience to do that because a you don't have to do this and b you're dealing with interns who are neurodiverse right so well, there's a lot of articles out there that say how, and I've seen this in my work, how it's really hard for people who are neurodiverse to succeed in the workplace. So what would you say the key to your efforts and success of the interns are? Is it just, you know, continue to try and persist? Well, it's not about me and the interns. It's just that I'm trying to get, for instance, an employer to say, go with the person's strong points. Don't be weakness centered. I don't want to hear what the employee can't do. And if your employee needs an accommodation, give it to them. Give it to her or him. We can do a good job, you know? Exactly. And what's happening now, and one of the reasons things are turning around for the better, is the big companies are realizing. Like when somebody like me says to them, not because of me, but hey, don't do this to be nice, mm. Microsoft. Do it so you can make more money. If you get this person who happens to have Asperger's, who's considered a computer for 20 straight hours and bang things out like nobody's business and work twice as fast as them, what are you going to give him a hard time for? Exactly. You know, if he needs... Uh, a separate little workspace so he's not being bothered, let him have it, you know, whatever it takes. It's really getting the education and the understanding from, you know, the the C-level executives and employees to know how to work with people's strengths. Well, and, it's and it's funny because when I look at, people who are experts in it. One fellow who was a master of it, may he rest in peace, who I'm doing a documentary on, is Angelo Dundee, who was the world's greatest boxing trainer and manager. Had a zillion world champions, including Muhammad Ali. He had everybody. And his philosophy was, you can only work with what you got, <laughs> okay? So he didn't treat every fighter the same like so many fight managers do. Mm -hmm. if, and my manager and trainer, Tommy Torino, was the same way, you know, same way. He said to me when I was fighting, you know, my 26 pro heavyweight fights, he said, look, you're old because I got started at it very old in the pros anyway. How old were you? I was 38. But I had won the Golden Glove when I was 21. But then um, I didn't go pro for 17 years. I had a layoff. And then I went pro 
because I wanted to generate publicity and funds for various children's charities. Not because I'm a goody two shoes, because you are a goody two shoes. Well, it makes me happy. I think, by the way, being a goody two shoes like yourself is selfish because you feel better when you do something nice for somebody. Of all course. the studies have shown all the happy chemicals and the oxytocin. When you receive a gift, you make a lot of them, but when you give a gift, you make more. So if you want to feel better, do for others. Do yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's fun. It was a National Geographic brain magazine and they had a quick tip on how to become happier and it was to do for others. I read that yesterday. Yeah. So how do you manage all this? Obviously you have your purpose, you have your mission, but it's not an easy feat. And I know you focus on the strengths of everyone, but you have a big conglomerate. How do you, how do you do all that? The only part I find challenging is uh, getting the funds for it, you know, which we, we run very lean, very lean. Most of the stuff we do doesn't cost anything, you know, except time. Mm -hmm. And there are so many nice people out there who will donate their time. I don't ask them for money, but donate your time. Yeah. We got a kid here who's, uh, thinking of going to medical school, what does he have to do to apply to get into a medical school? And then I'll interview somebody who's a director of admissions at a medical school. Or like the wonderful Angelique Harris at Boston University, who's the director of uh, neuro, the director of diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. at, at Boston University School of Medicine. And we'll learn some tips. We'll learn some things. You know, what do you need to do to achieve your goal? Mm. And this is coming from me who got expelled in the first grade and the 10th grade. <laughs> okay, so. For what? I wasn't a bad kid. I, I just, I had a thought. I've always had an authority problem. So I like to, like what you like to do, I like to be my own boss. Let's yeah. put it like that. Yeah, I hear you. So you have a uh, self-diagnosed ADHD, correct? Yeah, it hasn't been formally diagnosed because I didn't want to get labeled. <laughs> but uh, in talking to all people like yourself and reading books like yours and learning everything I've learned, I think I could be a poster child in a way. But yeah. I approach it as like you do, as a what are the strengths of that? You know, mm -hmm. I don't look at it as a negative. Uh, forgetting forgetting ADHD, I don't look at my own personality, which some people hate. I I don't dislike it. I like to use it as an advantage. Yeah, I want to try that. Oh, you do that? Or uh, why mm -hmm. can't I do that? Why can't I play that? Let me try. And... And then sometimes you hit a wall where you try something, you try to do something and you fail at it. Mm. You fail miserably. That's okay. That's what you learn the most from. I mean, yeah. You asked me what, what I learned the most from boxing were my most humiliating defeats on national television and the schedule 10 round that it get totally beat up and knocked down and knocked and stopped and the whole world to see it and then have ESPN show it every 10 minutes. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to remember that. Yeah, I'm going to remember that. That's going to be encoded in my brain and I'm going to, because of my negativity bias, remember that and learn from it, hopefully. But you have such a positive outlook on things. I mean, with ADHD, many of us struggle with rejection. So, you know, it's funny because, and we're so scared of failure and perceived rejection very often. And yesterday I saw a post, I think it was from Russell Brunson, that even if you fail, you have momentum with your failure, like that's still momentum. So I would like for you to share what your strategies are to perceive failure head on and perceive it as momentum or perceive it as a learning lesson? Well, first of all, do a uh, post-mortem diagnosis of why you failed. 
the doctor comes out of you. <laughs> Why did I fail? But then you have to back up to ask the question that my late great mentor, Bernie Carsonell, who was wonderful and also our accountant and helped me get different brains started. I miss him greatly. He always made everybody answer the question. What are you trying to accomplish? And surprisingly, many times that'll stop you in your tracks. You know, and you have to answer it. You got to answer it. What am I yeah. trying to accomplish by getting in the ring, knowing I can get my brains beat in? When all these people are telling me, don't do it, don't do it. What am I trying to accomplish? And it makes you examine it as you're mm -hmm. real. You can do the same thing with your broadcast. Why am I doing this? And you know why you're doing it. And you're helping a lot of people. And you got to answer that. It's funny how once you challenge yourself to say, what am I trying to accomplish? You go in different pathways too. For instance, if you ask, well, how do I want to make this difference? Well, write a book. Oh, have a podcast. Oh, have a newsletter. Oh, do. And then if your brain is like mine, you go, all right, I'll do all of it. <laughs> no, all at the same time. <laughs> You're not allowed to do all of it. You have to do one thing. I say, no, I don't. I don't have to do just one thing. And it irritates people. I don't do it just to irritate people. But believe me, when I was doing my pro boxing, seeing people on national media trying to kill me, you know, this guy, he shouldn't be fighting. He's too old. And he's a doctor. Why is he doing that? He shouldn't be allowed to do it. And, and uh, you know, when I first tried, I got turned down for a license. I had to appeal it because wow. they won't let you box over the age of 35. And also for other reasons, too. And then, then I had to pass the physical, had to do a lot of stuff. But it was uh, not making myself into a hero, but... People do that every day. There are people do that every day who go to work and support their family and take their kid to the gym, and to the playground, and go to the school to talk to the teacher and try to get the best for their kids. That's the American dream Yeah. on this 911. You know, I was a, I'm a big believer in it. My folks were too. My folks had high school degrees got married when they were like, I don't know, 20, started having kids right away, had a gas station, both worked. All four kids got college educations and mm -hmm. went into what they wanted to do and their grandkids and so on and so forth. That's the America I grew up with in the 50s, you know. Yeah. And I'm nostalgic yeah. for it, you know. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you follow work your hard, own you get rewarded. You know, exactly. You hit a bad break. Okay. And go to the next one. And so it sounds like you're separating yourself also from the failure. Like you're not a failure. You failed. What's your mission? Where do you want to get to? Why are you even doing this and figure it out from there? Yeah. Be comfortable with being different. Yeah. In the same way, any of your differences you might find, whether it be, Asperger's, autism, LGBTQ. I mean, you, you name it. If you're different, you're different. If that's the way your brain is wired, then if it's a bad thing, change it if you can or try to change it. But if it's a good thing, go with the flow. Hacky, how do you define failure? How do I define failure? Well, to me, uh, boxing's always been a metaphor for life. I remember when I came back from my crushing loss on national TV, and it was it was just horrible. And uh, I came back, and my daughter Rebecca who was my daughter at the time, who's now Asa, who's now transgender, so he's my son. That's a different thing. Um, 
she looked at my broken nose and my black eye and she said, Daddy, do you feel bad? And this was like, I got back real late in the morning, you know. She was a little kid, like eight years old. And I said, uh, I said, listen to me, this is this might be one of the most important things I have to teach you. I am so sad and disappointed because I really thought, because I was delusional, <laughs> I was going to be heavyweight champion of the world and win all these fights and do everything. Go big. I was, 45, I was 45 years old at the time at this fight. And uh, I said, and I feel sad and disappointed, but I don't feel bad. You know why? I trained as hard as I could. I never quit. I know I didn't get I didn't stop getting up. The referee stopped the fight. I was getting up. I kept getting knocked down. I kept getting up. And I tried as hard as I could. So I don't feel bad. And I want you to get the difference between the two. Because if you never try to do anything, you're not living. Yeah. Nope. You gotta go for it. You gotta go for it. Whatever it is for you, but you have to define what it is. That's beautiful. How do you know when it's time to stop doing whatever it is? Sometimes you don't. Somebody, somebody you love or somebody you trust or a professional has to tell you. You know, Tommy Torino had to say, I'm not letting you fight anymore. <laughs> That's it. Do you I'm want CTE? You're a doctor. You know what your brain's going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and sometimes you do yourself. And sometimes it's a best friend. In the same way, it can be the opposite. Don't quit. You can do this. You can do this. And then some people, without even meaning it, will discourage you and try to deter you from trying to do something that's real hard to do. You know, <laughs> I remember, I remember the, uh, the fellow who interviewed me at Boston University, I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, we had a great family doctor. And I started writing letters to the AMA when I was like 11 years old. I said, Yeah, I want to be a doctor. But I don't want it to take so long. Uh, you know, what do we got to do here? Of course, the ADHD mentality. The, the, <laughs> the list of all the medical schools, and four of them had red checks. And they were the accelerated programs. And one of them was Boston University was a six-year medical program. Wow. Where you did college in two years. All just by utilizing summers, you still took the same credits and everything. And then you were right in medical school, so it was fast, so. I interviewed my junior year in high school <laughs> and I got this guy interviewed me. You've met the kind of person, Brooke, they, they wanted to be at Harvard university and they weren't, you know? So they, they thought were they were better than ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Better. And they were officious. And, um, I said, well, I'm, you know, looking at your letter here and it's, uh, you know, uh, I see you, uh, you got expelled and you know, what was that about? And I, I told him what that was about, and uh, my grades were good. I said, my grades are pretty good, you know. He said, well, yeah, but you're never going to get into this program. I said, why? Well, your SATs. And I had done well on the SATs. They said, you'd have to bring these up 100, 150 points to be considered, you know. I said, but the rest of me is pretty good, huh? I said, yeah, you know, but I wouldn't even try it. You know, lower your sights, maybe just go to undergrad and, and go the regular route. So I went home, called up some friends and said, we got to study for these SATs. And I brought up my boards, 200 points, okay, by wow. learning every word in the world in these silly books. I still remember some of the words I learned studying for the boards, and I've never seen them before or since except on the SATs. Lim, L-I-M-N, means to portray. Have you ever heard of that word? I no, no. Um, so this guy did you a favor. You had so much motivation yeah, to prove him wrong. 
Well, then I called him up and he said, who's this? I says, Hacky Reitman, who are you? I'm a guy from Jersey City. He said, well, what are you said? Well, you said I had to bring up my boards of 150 points. I just want you to know I brought him up 200. Now, if you don't accept me, you got a problem. And I hung up. But he had nothing to do with the admissions. The admissions committee really was looking in the six-year program for motivation. They really were. And they were looking for well-rounded students. But I got to say, when I did finally get accepted by the skin of my teeth, and I went to the orientation, I was scared. I was absolutely fearful. These people had taken college courses in these great high schools, you know. I'm competing against these people, and they're going to, and then I found out they're going to throw out half of us because they're going to curve the grades so that the median grade is a C plus and you need a B minus to get promoted. So mm -hmm. it was like a back deck. So yeah. I wanted to quit. I wanted to quit. I called, I called up my mother. May she rest in peace. <laughs> I called her from a pay phone in the dormitory. I said, mom, these kids are, I'm never going to make it here. I, I want to, I just want to go the regular way. I'm never going to make it to this. And she said, son, if you try as hard as you can and they throw you out, you come home and we'll take care of you. But if you quit, you don't have a home. And she hung up on it. Good for her. Standing there at this payphone with a line in the dormitory in 1968. <laughs> And Georgie goes, my friend Georgie goes, what'd she say? She said, well, I guess we better study. You know, it's, it's, I love the old school mentality for the sense of uh, commitment. You know, you make a commitment for right or wrong, you know, and you stick with it. Like you get over your fear and you continue on with it until however long it is that you need. Of course, as long as it's the right commitment for you. And we do that with uh, my stepson. Both of my stepsons have ADHD. The younger one is 10. He is obsessed with soccer. The older one, he wants to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> Jiu-jitsu, the play, soccer, basketball. Now he wants to be a professional soccer player. Before that, he <laughs> wanted to be a professional YouTuber. Like, you know, the world is his and he has it. Trust me, he's bright and he's motivated and he does not like to follow rules either. So my husband, his mom and I said, look, <laughs> you can play soccer because he wants to do travel soccer, right? He's 12 years old. He wanted to be on a travel soccer team, not playing soccer since he was like five. He wants to try out for a travel soccer team, one of the best travel soccer teams at 12 years old. I like this you, kid. Right? He's awesome. You can try out for it. And when you make it, you can't do anything else. You can't play basketball. You can't do the play because it's going to be a full commitment. You are going to have to practice all of their practices. You're going to have to do their trainings. You're going to have to show up to their games. And you're going to have to commit over 100% in this soccer league because it's the best of the best. He said, fine. And he made it. He made the practice team. But that's because he's a goalie and there are already two goalies on the team. But if he continues to stay, I think he's better than some of the goalies that are already there. If he continues to commit, he will be a professional goalie. Like that's how motivating and committed wow. he could be when he's you know, excited Good about something. Him. And it's, it's the smarts in him too. It's not necessarily the physical ability. It's just like he knows, you know, he can see where the ball is coming ahead of time. So anyway back to the point, you can do whatever you want to do, but don't feel that like it's okay to get here and then stop because you're forgetting about why you started in the first place. And there's another corollary to it too. And you got to pay for your own rent. In other words, you want to be the a doctor, a soccer player, whatever you want to be, that's fine. But at some point, you got to pay your own rent. And you got to make sure that you're going to be able to do that. 
And I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You have to figure it out. If you want it, you got to pay your rent. So yeah. you want to be a professional athlete, that's great. But figure out how it is you get your education along the way or or whatever, whatever it might be, whatever it might be. And I'll tell you a pleasant problem we're having in that regard at the Boys and Girls Club of Broward County, where I'm on the board. And it's a very pleasant problem. The pleasant problem is this. Our kids are learning from, like some of our big donors and great people are these big companies. And these companies, whether they be electricians or plumbers or construction, they're looking for workers. You know, when we're telling our kids, you must graduate high school. We have a 96% high school graduation rate. And then we want you to go to college, but more importantly, we want you to be able to support your family and break the cycle, you know, mm -hmm. make a good living and everything else, you know. Well, guess what? Fast forward to now. <laughs> where they got recruited to be interns in carpentry and construction and electrician. They're finishing high school. Thank you very much. And they're making their 80,000, 90,000 a year. They don't want to go to college. Why do they have to? And it goes to the Bernie question. What are you trying to accomplish? And then we have to go back to the drawing board and say, what are we really trying to accomplish? Do we want to not see these kids go to college? What do we want to do? And it's, it's made for a great internal debate because anyone else from the outside look at that, say, oh, you're greatly successful. You got a 96% high school graduation rate. Which, by the way, high school diploma is the measuring stick in so many things that I, I've just learned the past number of years. For instance, if you're a female and you don't get married till you're 21 and you don't get pregnant till you're 21 and you have a high school diploma, if you do those things, you have a 97% chance of never living in poverty. Wow. Yeah. Sobering. Yeah. Yeah. But unfortunately, in the populations of the underserved and that we deal with, um, X percent of the females get pregnant before they're 15 impregnated by a family member. Oof. So these are the nightmares they're coming out of you know, to uh, do that. But I digress. Wow, that's heavy. Um, I don't even remember what we were even talking about before you started to That's because to that. both people on this party line have ADHD. So what were I we went saying? Off, I went off into the wild blue yonder. I was you... truly listening to what you were saying. <laughs> Hacky, what would you, going back to first and 10th grade when you got expelled, is there anything that you would have done differently for yourself or is there anything that you would have wanted your teachers to know uh, at that time? No, I don't think so. Because I think that the the good teachers did understand it and the principal understood it even though I had to be expelled, you know, the, um, the first grade one, I had a friend I would, you know, go to school, walk to school with. I was in public school. Mm -hmm. I know his parents both worked and I know what time they let, you know, it was a neighborhood. So you knew everything mm -hmm. going on. We were horsing around in school and, you know, he got shoved and he got a big splinter in his leg. Mm. And the teacher, you know, nurse came and, and you know, we got to do this. We got to, you know, do that and everything. Ooh. 
and take him to the hospital and call the ambulance. And I said, no, you can't because his parents go to work and it's they we're going to miss him if we wait. So I got a couple of the kids. We made like a little armchair ambulance for him because we only lived a couple of blocks away. We brought him to his house. His parents took him to the hospital and everything. The teacher and principal took exception to this and I got expelled. But you got expelled for taking him to his parents yeah, to take him to the for hospital. Not listening to the authorities, doing it the way the book says, so they wow. don't get sued and everything else. And in the world of inclusion, you run into that you run into that stuff all the time. All the time. That's why I left the public school system. I have all respect for the schools that I worked in yeah. and the administrators, but the law, unfortunately, doesn't always, you know, get followed or get you know, serve students the way that they need it. Yeah. And it could also work the opposite way. Sometimes they get too much and they don't need it. So I think you and I are not real black and white thinkers and we're not rule followers hundred percent. But I want and to make it clear that people like you and I, you and I both really, really appreciate all the good teachers a hundred percent. We know how hard it is. Oh my gosh. Yes. I one of my mentors besides you is uh, my principal, Donald Gately. He worked with me for seven years and he was fantastic. He got me to where I was. He helped me along the way. He was a do-gooder like you. And I have amazing memories with him and many of the administrators and teachers that I've worked with and a lot of respect but it's not about them. Sometimes it's about the education legal system. And sometimes people follow it and sometimes people don't. And when you have your own company, right? And your own private company, you have the liberty to essentially not follow the book, right? Oh, a hundred percent. It's, it's, uh, and it's a very good distinction your viewers and listeners might not realize you've made between a private company, which I've been involved with a lot. And if you're in a not-for-profit organization like I am now, it's one of the reasons I didn't want to make it like that because you're, there are rules you have to follow. You just have mm -hmm. to do it. Whereas if you're a private company, you don't. It's tough when you're a rule breaker to be in a system, but that's why God created boards because our board looks over us and they get stuck with all that stuff. <laughs> and Joseph, who runs a great show here. Oh, he's amazing. You know, runs the whole show. They get all that stuff. I get the good stuff like this. I get to hang out with Brooke Schnittman, you know, <laughs> and, have a good time. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you deserve to hang out with good people because you're amazing. You've created this mission and vision. And when hopefully I do outlive you way in the future, when you do pass, um, I can't wait to celebrate different brains, <laughs> you and all that you've done for society. And, um, the neurodiverse population. Well, I want to thank you for all your encouragement and leadership and encouraging us with all of the multimedia and podcasts and audio and movies we're making and documentaries and articles because you have done it all and you're an inspiration. So thank you very much, Brooke. One big love fest. Um, so <laughs> Dr. Hackey Reitman, officially, where can people find you if they want more understanding, more help? Maybe they want to be an intern for Different Brains. Go to differentbrains.org. Everything's on the website. Hit us with an email. We love everybody. So, you know, if you want to volunteer, and we want you to know this, if you're thinking of becoming an intern at doing a mentorship with us or volunteering. We are not one size fits all. 
I have some interns going to school and holding down a job who come to us and spend maybe five hours a week in their spare time. They just come on our meetings and group meetings. It's a great socialization process. And we have people who devote lots and lots of time to it. And it's all what you can fit into your unique schedule. You have priorities. You got your family, friendships, school, making a living. We recognize that. And we don't discriminate on your age, except you have to be at least 18. But we have, uh, we have interns uh, in their 50s who are working and teaching, have families and doing great things. Having a different brain, we want to end the stigma, you know. We're like a medal of honor. Yeah, my brain's a little different, you know. Yeah, I go to a psychiatrist. Yeah, I have anxiety. Oh, I have dyslexia. I have trouble reading. Yeah, so what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love that. So thank you, Brooke. Keep up the great work you're doing. Right back at we'll, you. And we'll see you at differentbrains.org. Yes, and if you if what Dr. Hacky Reitman resonated with you and you want to make a difference, um, you can always donate on their site at differentbrains.org as well to help give back to the neurodiverse population. And yeah, Dr. Reitman, I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye, Brooke. Thanks for listening to this episode of Successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, feel free to reach out to us at coachingwithbrooke.com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.